Father God, we, we praise you and we thank you for your son who came to perform great works in your name, creation, redemption, the new heaven and the new earth. And now we have the mind of Christ and he is seated next to you and everything is under his feet but it hasn't appeared to be under his feet yet and we want to be under so that authority can flow down from his precious feet to us. We can be under that authority and then other spirits are subject unto us because of that. So we pray that you would just speak to us now, Lord. We realize that your government's on Christ's shoulders, and we just thank you so much for that. That we don't have to carry that crushing weight. But um, he submitted to brutality, so all we had to do is submit to love. So bless this class now, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Matt, did that gentleman hand you that sheet when you came in? Okay, Grace has it. Yeah, someone had their hand up? Yes. If any, people, people, um, the question is, on the five points of a developed worldview, which was, I, I was thinking about it today for no reason but to think about it. Um, it was because of my accent, which is hideous, I know. But if, if, if you can't be from England, I think the next, next best place to be from for language, I guess, is Boston, so it's not so bad. But um, of course, I destroy the Queen's English. It, on the last part, I said, what is the meaning of history, if any? And that's uh, people who are cynical throw that in. Because we... The five points of a developed worldview is not, the Christian church didn't produce that for their own studies. That happens to be something you get in sociology class. Or if you study psychology, anthropology, all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of subjects where they, if you are um, studying cosmology at a university, you would be looking at the five points of a developed worldview. By the way, I'm gonna turn off my phone be nice if you turn, your off, turn yours off. But if you don't, we'll just mock you if it rings. <laughs> Internationally on that camera. Um, the five points of a developed worldview, uh, by the way, are an awesome, are an awesome thing um, for you to keep in mind when you're talking to people who are currently being educated. You know, students just are jumping with um, the last thing they heard from class that the rest of the class liked, that there are certain subjects at colleges when you're studying them together, you're all bored to death, but other subjects are very exciting. And sometimes people just jumping with that information and they're talking with you and one of the, bridge, the bridges over into the gospel could be um, one part of the five points of a developed worldview. When you study apologetics, we have these things called bridge points and then uh, we have these things called static points. And um, you're responsible for this, by the way. Some of you almost had no content in your outline. I'm really cheering that on our third outline, we're going to have content. We'll be up to speed by our fourth outline. Don't worry, you're not going to fail. Unless you're the Antichrist. <laughs> then I'm determined to fail you somehow. And um, I don't see anyone slick enough to be the Antichrist, so you're all safe. Someone is sitting there saying, I'm as slick as the Antichrist. You don't want to be. Okay. Um, you can utilize the five points of a developed worldview. Usually when we talk a bridge point, we're trying to fi find a principle in Scripture that will act as a bridge b from where their mind is at and their mindset over to your mindset. It's actually, your, your, your mind is acting as a bridge between their mind and the mind of Christ. Did you know there's a bridge in your brain? It's called the corpus callosum. It's a bridge between your left and right brain. 
and it is an amazing it is an amazing function. It's like you are a, you're a, you. Uh, let me see how. We, what's a good illustration? Oh, a dual core computer. A computer with two cores. Uh, they used to have twin. I think there were 356Bs. That's the first time they showed they had a, a twin processor in a computer. Why did they come up with a twin processor in a computer? Because they were trying to copy the human brain. And I think the, the science of making them both talk to each other is bias science. That's as much as I know. I know that much. I memorize that. So when someone that's hip on computers tries to blow me away with what they know, I, I have some ammo to shoot at them. But um, your, your brain, your mind, is acting as a bridge between the mind of Christ and the mind of the sinner. Remember we went over the priesthood? And how that, what, what's that word? The pontifex was the builder of the bridge. And they thought that the person was some kind of mystic or ma magician. You have that kind of mojo when they brought <laughs> the, the Gospels to the Caribbean world, people, instead of saying magic, they had the word mojo, that this guy has magic. They would say, he's got mojo, magic. And you have a certain amount of mojo. There used to be a song, you've got your mojo working. It's a very old song, I'm dating myself. Are there any other questions that had to do with language or theology that um, I breezed over that um, evaded you? Yes. You mean um, the 50, yes. 50 points of evangelism? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. It's all right if your dog ate it. Would you pass that down? To Garvin, the troublemaker. Last week he was laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Who needed one over here? It was me, Yankov. Oh, you, Yankov. <laughs> Hungry dogs. Rebecca, you're going to have to come up here. I know. This is is one of those days. Okay. You have to wear the right clothes to come up here, right? Have a good hair day going, everything. It's pretty hard being a woman, isn't it? Never tried to be one. <laughs> yes, Rebecca. Um, could you talk more about the static points? Oh, oh, okay. Um, static points and bridge points. Um, when we have someone who, let's say a Buddhist, because I don't think we have any Buddhists in here or former Buddhists. Let's take Buddhism. If, if you're studying Buddhism, um, the Bible, what they consider their holy book, is so huge that it is from the floor up to my chin, probably. There's so many holy, the, the Sanskrit, uh, not Sanskrit, well, what do you call it? Bhagavad Gita? That's, you sure that's Buddhist? It's not Hindu. Not Hindu. Uh, no, I know, yeah, that's what I was going to go to. I, I didn't have the, the total name of all their scriptures, but at either rate, they have these things called cones, and the cones are their proverbs. I'll give you a proverb that I heard when I was a young boy studying judo. And uh, one problem with martial arts, if you're a parent, is that sometimes you send your children off to a dojo, they give them a nice little yin-yang patch for the, the breast of their uniform, their kimono, and it's Buddhism. And if you go into one of those dojos, there is, if this fruit or anything growing on their little wall of honor, they call their, um, their homni, um, then there's, Buddha, there's Buddhism being taught in that dojo. Um, but here's one that I was told as a child to keep me in line. The nail that stands up shall be pounded down. The nail that stands up will be pounded down. Let me throw something out at you. If we humble ourselves, we'll be exalted. If we humble ourselves. They're in the same neighborhood. And they're trying to teach something 
both of them are roving around the issue of self-exaltation. And we can find more accurate proverbs in the scriptures that almost sound exactly like the nail that stands up shall be pounded down. Now, if you're talking with a Buddhist about the arrogance of modern culture, and they bring it up, and you happen um, to ask them about that cone, they might be shocked that you know it. Maybe they don't know it themselves. There's so much to study in Buddhism. That's why the samurai like Zen Buddhism, because Zen Buddhism's like Pentecostalism. You're all psyched up about Buddhism, but you don't know a thing about it, really. You're just like chopping people's heads off. So, and then thanking the Buddha for success. You thank the Buddha that you were able to chop the other fellow in two pieces. And this is a bridge point between their mind and your mind. The fact that there are proverbs in the scripture that are dealing with the same principle, that it concerns the Christian about arrogance. Right? It does concern us. I'm concerned about my own arrogance. I'm sure you are about yours sometimes. Some of you might be very humble, I don't know. I've never been really humble, so it's hard to know. The, the funny thing about humility is when you realize that you don't have an ounce of it, you just got some. You ever have a revelation about how arrogant you were and you, you despair that you don't have any humility, you just got some. It's a mystery, isn't it? There's a lot of things like that. It's like when you realize that something, something in your life needs love to aimed at it and you realize that you don't have any love for it, you're actually getting some love for it at that moment. That the familiarity in your life is now abating in that area. So. There are bridge points that we can talk with people, which means we give, they realize that there, there is this principle and they're crossing over into Christianity and wondering about you and you uh, are interested in them and they realize it. And there's similarities between what you believe. They're, they're, you know, I've been to Japan a couple of times and traveled actually extensively in Japan in short periods of time, did a lot of traveling. And one of the things I learned that um, surprised me was that, um, that they are, Buddhists are terrified of death in one way. I'm not talking, you know, a Tibetan monk that you bumped, in, uh, bumped into last time you were in Kathmandu buying drugs for your European pals when you were backslidden. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking to someone who's sitting in front of a giant gong all day going yum yum, you know, none of that. I'm talking to the typical Japanese or Taiwanese Buddhist. Those, those people typically, they're afraid of death because there is no resolution for them in death. There is nothing to look forward to. If they can break the curse of samsara, you know, the curse of you're climbing a giant spiral staircase of morality. And if you can get to the top, you're going to dive off a springboard into the Buddha's mind and disappear. There's a lot of Buddhists who don't even want to get there. They'd rather, come, they'd, rather, they'd rather come back as the neighbor's monkey and get kicked around a little than do that. Because at least they'll have some existence. There'll be a self. There'll be something to them. I remember, uh, I will digress. I remember this, um, this Buddhist. How many of you know what Pol Pot is? Uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia is when the Khmer Rouge, which was a, a Marxist kind of army, um, traveled um, from the, nor the north of Cambodia into the south, and they killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. They just slew them. And Christians were especially the brunt of that, but everyone was getting it. This family, this well-to-do family, there was an important doctor in Cambodia who knew most of the politicians. Methodist missionaries were doing their best to smuggle people out of the country quickly and leave themselves. And this doctor left with his family. Methodist missionaries helped him out. He worked at Hopkins. Um, and his son, Peter, Peter Chim, an awesome young guy, he came in to train with me. 
And he was a very capable martial arts kind of guy. You know, he was like a tall, skinny Bruce Lee. And he wanted me to train him in jujitsu, so I trained him, and we became very tight. And he disappeared. He used to disappear and then come back. You know, he's one of those mysterious students. He, mis he takes off for a year, then one night, he just suddenly appears out of nowhere, trains two nights, and disappears again. And all the girls liked him because he was humble and cute like Bruce Lee. One day I was trained, I had a private lesson. I need money, I like to teach private lessons when I need money. I'm teaching these two guys. And we have most of the lights off because it's a very bright, sunny day. And I look up at the front of the, the club and I see this head, the shaved head in the light. And you could see the sunlight hit this head and the head was shiny. And I just looked. I could tell it was someone oriental just by looking and seeing the eyes faintly. And I'm looking, and the way the guy sat, Peter's posture's um, very erect. I said, Peter. He said, Sensei. I said, Peter, is something wrong? Because he just appeared. You know, it was one of his appearances. I said, do you want to come out and train? He says, no. I'll sit here. So we did the whole thing. The guys left. And I sat down across from Peter. I said, Peter, you look troubled. What's wrong? He said, well... The Buddhist priest that escaped Cambodia with my family and I died. And I just went to his funeral and I candidated to be a priest. And that's the reason why I have no hair. He said I was venerated. And that means they were, actually, they were touching him and worshiping him as a priest. And he told me that. And he didn't say another thing. He's just staring at me. And we still have the lights on. The, you know, the dust, the sunlight. It was one of those... Kung Fu moments. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of those things. It's like a movie. I'm staring back at Peter. I'm saying, Peter, did that bother you that people were venerating you? He said, yes. I said, what did it feel like? He looked at the floor. He said, I felt unworthy. And I said, that's smart because we're not worthy. He says, I know. And I said, Peter, if I wanted to go with you to Buddhist heaven, how would I go? I already knew, but I wanted him to tell me in his own words. So Peter told me the story about samsara and the, you know, karma and karmic retribution and all this stuff. And then he got to the part about diving into the Buddha. And I'm listening. I said, Peter, are you comfortable with that? He said, no. No. I said, how did this all come about? He said, I went to the funeral and before that, uh, one of my cousins in Lynn, Massachusetts died and I thought of you because you were from the city next door. And I said, oh, I thought I should be quiet. Then Peter said to me, because I asked him how to get to Buddhist heaven. He said to me, tell me about your heaven. So I told him. And he had this very faint smile on his face as he listened, he nodded with his eyes squinting. And when I was through, I, it was my shortest version of going to heaven. And I said, Peter, what do you think of that? He says, I like that. I didn't even ask him if he wanted to be saved. Because I know those Methodists were beating him with the gospel when he came out of Cambodia when he was a little boy. So that was the month of June. I, you know, how many of you remember we used to have the Grace Hour booth to raise money for radio years ago? We used to, I used to run that. It was the biggest booth. We made thousands for radio. Peter shows up at the booth, unannounced. I just see him standing there at the end of the counter staring at me. I said, Peter, what are you doing here? He says, I want to work. I said, in here? He says, yeah. He hopped over the counter, served the whole week. And then he disappeared again. <laughs> Have not seen him since. But when I was in Japan, I remembered that visit with Peter when I met people. And I realized that they were very, very uncomfortable with heaven. Because a doctor told me, he says, when my patients are dying, I do not tell them. I tell their family. And he says, their families don't tell them. Their friends usually do not tell them. And I said, why is that? I knew what he would say. He was talking about this. 
We fear death because we don't know what's going to become of us when we die. So people let you die without telling you you're dying. They let you make plans for vacation or buy tickets, and you just die, and you go into that abyss of death with no clue. Now, when you meet people like that, if we try to blow them away with our track or something like that, we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of years of culture built up in them. They might not even understand their culture or the religious training they've been subject to at all, but they have attitudes and they're emotionally invested in the attitude of their family, of their village, of their town, of their city, of their country, and, and it's saturated in their academic world as well by how they view fatalistically death, war, um, sickness, uh, tsunamis, whatever. So when we come to them and we talk to them so many times, if you have time to spend with someone uh, that even an atheist, we are looking for bridge points, things I can talk about that act as a bridge so their mind looks across this bridge at the other side and realizes that my soul is concerned with some of the same subjects that they are concerned about. Integrity, jealousy, mo how money is spent, greed, and all these things. Um, vanity. Right? What does the scripture say? What is it that knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Then it goes on to say, what things know the things of God except the spirit that is of God? The only one that can understand God is God. And then Paul goes right on to say it in Corinthians. And that's why we're given of his spirit. If God didn't give you his spirit, you could not know God. Man by wisdom knew not God. God has sealed you in your forehead with his spirit. That's the only reason you can understand God. The natural mind receiveth not the things of God. When people tell me they don't believe in God, I usually say to them, I, I know you don't. I know you can't. You couldn't anyway. Then they look at you like you're a wise guy. What are you saying? I'm stupid? No, I'm saying unless God gives you faith, you can't even believe him because faith is a gift. And sometimes people say, oh, well, where do you get it? And then God gives it to you and you receive Christ. Then you'll believe. What's the prophecy concerning the Jews? What does Paul say about the Jews? The Jews have a veil over their eyes for season for our benefit. As we're added and grafted into God's family, they are blind. But what's the prophecy? How is it that the Jews actually do see Christ? It says that I will pour out the spirit of grace. We've talked about it in this class. Upon the house of David and they will look. Now they cannot look. Especially a Jew when you give a tract to a Jew. Especially a Jew. When you're witnessing to a Jew, if that Jewish person is going to be saved... It's a divine, it's a, it's a completely divine appointment. That person is definitely elected to be saved. You don't just blow a Jew away with a piece of paper. So here you have people that are steeped in hundreds of years, thousands of years of culture. And they are emotionally invested in what they believe. Like the five pots of faith. Um, I'm not going to even say them because then you'll write them down and think you have to. Have, well, some other day we'll talk about that. It's not pertinent to this course this second. But um, I just forgot what I was saying. <laughs> They're emotionally invested. Thank you. They're emotionally invested in what they believe. And we use bridge points, things that we hold in common. If you're listening to a person and you can read them, you are an expert on the human soul because you possess the human soul, you have the mind of Christ, and you have the scriptures. You have the objectivity of theology and you have the subjectivity of the spirit. 
And you, and you already had a human soul before you were saved. So you got all the ingredients to be an expert on the human soul. Spontaneously, too. The secret things belong to God, but those things what? Revealed in Deuteronomy 29, 29. Because they become our property. You have the capacity to receive revelation. Look at any believer losing their mind. Why are they losing their mind? They're not receiving revelation. Why? Because they're not interested currently. It doesn't interest them. They're busy exploring self. They haven't got a snoot full of self yet. They need to be completely sick of themselves before they're ready to get some revelation from God. Okay, so a bridge point would be a point of that is a bridge between the mind of God and the mind of the unbeliever that's facilitated through the mind of Christ that you possess. You are the bridge itself. You're building that bridge. And a static point is just arguing, winning an argument with someone who's unsaved and they go walking away unsaved. You might have won the argument in your own mind, but in their mind you lost the argument and they still remain an unbeliever. Do we, have any other, do we have any other questions from the first half of our semester that are drifting around your mind about any of the ground we've covered or any of the phrases we've used, whether they're theological or um, pop culture? Now, we left off at point four in your um, 50 points of evangelism, child evangelism, it says bus ministry. Uh, the newer version of this, which I cannot find one. I'm sure I've got like 50 of them someplace. I can't find it. It's child evangelism. Luke 18 tells, Jesus is saying, uh, allow the little children to come unto me. Okay, now we covered that. And what do we say the most important thing about that is? Having what kind of an approach? Having a, a canned approach, which is a means for us to demonstrate our accountability to the parent. Sometimes people of another religion will give you their children just to get their children out from under them. And uh, some of you mothers can attest to this, some of you ladies that have been mothers that you don't realize how awesome it was to have children until they're grown up and they're gone while you had them. You were beating on them and ridiculing them and destroying them, and then when they left, you realized they were precious. I wish I knew that when I had them. <laughs> I'll make up for it. I'll be an awesome grandparent. That's why a lot of people are better grandparents than they were parents. So we want that accountability. One other thing we have to talk about when we talk about children is, is their capacity. The major law of communication that you should think of, you should think about whether you're at work, working for the man, as they say, or whether you're serving God is, all communication addresses capacity. All communication must address capacity. Second law, you cannot legislate capacity. You cannot legislate capacity. You can't ask a child why they didn't solve this problem if, if they're children, they could not have solved the problem. You're legislating capacity. Guys, how many guys in here are married? If you're married, raise your hand. Okay, you guys may put your hand down. How many men here intend to be married someday when they get around to it? A handful of others. Gentlemen, you cannot legislate capacity. When you open the door of a home, you're going into another world. The world of estrogen. Children, bad hair days, little demon-possessed children, little liars and cheaters and breakers of everything precious. 
children just want to drive their mother crazy. I can remember the, the three oldest boys in my family, myself being one of them, being mad at my mother. She forbid us to do something. We'd get on the couch and we'd bang our heads so hard on the back of the couch that the couch legs would go off the floor and bang back down. And we would say repeatedly, even if it was over an hour, banging our heads. I'm not saying we, it, it was not good for us to bang our heads that hard. But we drove my mother nuts. We kept saying, mommy's a bad girl. <laughs> With timing. We go, mommy's a bad girl. In the first 20 minutes, she'd be on the phone, ah, da, 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 watching a movie. Da, da. And at some point, my crazy mother, my mother was crazy without us driving her crazy. She's an art major. She has a master's in art. All people who are totally controlled by art are all soft. She's no exception. She would just like flip out. And sometimes she'd come in, she, her, her, first mas, her first major at college was um, physical education. So she was in great shape. She would just come in and beat on us. Then we'd all cry, and then we'd be crying. Same, we start up again. <laughs> Mommy's a bad girl. We would drive her stinking crazy. So here a guy comes home to that, something like that. He breaks the plane in that doorway. Comes in, hi. His wife, they are waiting for some attention of some kind from an adult. He just comes waltzing in there like nothing's wrong. I was at work while you were home here having a vacation on the couch. If you're married to a violent woman, something's going to happen. <laughs> but if he's a discerning fellow, filled with the spirit, the law of communication is in his mind. And it's not saying mommy is a bad girl. He's thinking to himself, all communication addresses capacity. And he stands there. How are you, honey? Those kids of yours. You must show concern, even if it doesn't interest you at all. You must show concern. <laughs> hmm. They did. I'm going to go talk to them. Don't hurt them. They're all black and blue already. <laughs> Not that we would ever do that. By the way, if you're watching on film, Greater Grace World Outreach does not endorse or condone or preach corporal punishment. You'll have to come to Bible college to see what the Bible says about it. Otherwise, you have no right to judge us. <laughs> this was paid for by Greater Grace World Outreach. <laughs> this ad was paid for. You can't legislate capacity. You know what's one of the funny things to watch is when you see someone trying to do something they have no capacity to do and they're under a lot of pressure to get it done. Did you ever see that? You've seen it, haven't you? The most hilarious things you'll ever see. You ever see someone who, during an emergency try to run up a hill that was wet with slippery shoes on like dress shoes? They're falling all over the place. Just watch YouTube. What do they call it? Fails or falls? Fails, fails. I'm not endorsing YouTube if you're watching on film. <laughs> so, all communication must address capacity. Now, we're talking about children. I know you already forgot what we were talking about because you lack capacity. So, my communication must address your lack of capacity. We're, talk <laughs> we're talking about children. You know, when you tell someone when I tell an adult, I just told a physicist this the other day, this guy who writes books. I told him about heaven. I said, soon Christ will return. He says, when? I said, maybe right after Damascus gets leveled by Russia. Does you think Damascus will be leveled by Russia? I said, yeah, based on the Bible and the news. He said, hmm. Maybe that's possible. He's thinking, you know. 
Then I said, then Jesus will come. He goes, the same Jesus? Same Jesus. What will he do? He's going to call us up. He goes, me? I said, no, not you. You're not a believer. <laughs> I told him this whole story. And he's looking at me. And this guy likes me. He's looking at me like I have three heads. Like, really? And, I, and he says, you believe this? I said, totally and absolutely. Right? But if you take a little child and sit them up here, and you say, you know what? Once upon a time, Jesus came here from outer space. We're in outer space, way up where the clouds are real fluffy with his father. His daddy's up there? Yes. His daddy has white hair. Well, does he have long hair? Yes. And a beard. Like Santa? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> you say, and around him are angels. Angels? Yeah, like big strong men with wings. And they're white. They go, oh. Where are they? They're up there with Jesus. Sometimes they're here, but they're hiding. <laughs> what a capacity they have. You tell children the most bizarre things from the Bible, they're like. <laughs> it's called eidetic imagery. E-I-D-E-T-I-C, eidetic imagery. And science has found that because of this eidetic imagery, here, I'll write it on my blackboard. E-I-D-E-T-I-C. If you're watching on camera, this is a special blackboard you can only see in class <laughs> that ought to compel you to come here. But this eidetic imagery means that when a child is somehow persuaded to believe what they have never seen, it is more real to them than the things that you see every day that are real. And this is why when children are told that the Easter Bunny is not coming because he does not exist, you completely freak them out if they really believe it and they weep because you've just stolen part of their life away. It's called eidetic imagery. You know what eidetic imagery is? It is a capacity of faith that the spirit can facilitate to make anything in the kingdom of God completely real to you. Science says that when you start studying math and social studies and things like that, that the eidetic capacity of a person is, is numbed till the person can't use it anymore. It's not totally dead, it's just completely numbed by pragmatism and science. Then science teaches you if you can't see it, it's not real. Just go into the communist world and train. Can't be demonstrated in laboratory, it's not real. Listen to Jesus. Until you become as one of these children. What was he talking about? He was talking about eidetic imagery. That you and I have what is known as the gift of faith. The gift of faith that is addressed by the mind of Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, things that are absolutely impossible for me to see with my naked eye because they're so remotely positioned for me, either by eternity or the fact that they're angelic or their kingdom or whatever it is that the Spirit of God can make it completely real to me. So when we're talking to children. Sometimes people think, oh, they're looking for the grown-ups. Is your daddy home? No. Is your mommy home? No. You realize this is a neglected kid. Oh, just tell them we were here. Hey, what about these kids? They have this unbelievable capacity to realize the things of the kingdom of God. If they're abused, their parents probably could care less what you tell them about God. And sometimes 
We need to take the liberty to talk to little souls that have this amazing capacity to believe. So we don't want to neglect young people because we think they're not as valuable as full-grown adults. They're just kids. That's the wrong mentality. Jesus said, bring, bring me the kids. Bring those kids over to me. I want to talk to them. And I'm sure his disciples were impatiently pacing in the background. Why is he talking to these kids? We've got to get moving. We've got to be in Jericho by 9 o'clock. <laughs> that, that's, I just made that up. They didn't wear wristwatches. They had a little sand dial there. <laughs> but um, we don't want to ignore their capacity. Okay? Okay, because children have an amazing capacity to think kingdom. To think kingdom. There are a lot of believers who are great believers, but they're so buried in their theology they can't think kingdom. You can't allow the gospel to become just a reflection of your theology. We want to grow in grace and knowledge. When, you, when we see phrases like grace and knowledge, or the love of God passes knowledge, that's almost like saying the love of God passes theology. I know that's blasphemous for some of you former Presbyterians, but you've got to hear that. How many former Presbyterians do we have here? There you go, there's your hiding up front. <laughs> That's where the Presbyterians come to get all the theology. <laughs> He's defending himself. Give him the mic. <laughs> Members of the jury. No, I'm not kidding. I, I, I love to read Presbyterian books, especially old ones. They're awesome. But it's grace and knowledge. Christ was filled with grace and truth. We don't want to limit our understanding of God to our theology. We need that theological base to stand on. And I'm heavily into theology. I wish I could cash my, my library in and get some of that dough back that I spent on it. As long as I didn't have to give up the books. But children have this amazing capacity to understand God without even possessing the mind of Christ. Because they have this eidetic imagery. And all eidetic imagery is in the human mind is a capacity that the Spirit of God later will use to facilitate the manifestation of God to make Him completely real to us when we receive the efficacious grace of salvation. And that's another subject. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father, we ask you to bless what we just heard, what we just thought about together to our capacity. In John 14, 26, Lord. And Every bit of it that's eternal that you can bring in remembrance, we pray that you do that for us in John 14, 26. Bless us now as we go to get recaffeinated. In Jesus' name, amen. Be back by 10 past because this class started late. <laughs>